What was supposed to be a fun and relaxing night for Christina Whitaker strangely turned into something very sinister. Christina was a 21-year-old mother who had planned to meet her friends for drinks at a bar on November 13, 2009. It was a chilly night in Hannibal, Missouri, and Christina was having a good time at the Rookies Bar. But the next morning, Christina was nowhere to be found. There wasn't a definite explanation for Christina's disappearance yet, only some spine-chilling possibilities. What happened to Christina that night? Did Christina have any dark secrets which got her involved with the wrong people? Welcome to Real Crime Story Time, where we bring you history's most mysterious crime stories. Today, we will be looking at the curious case of Christina Whitaker's disappearance, a mystery which still remains unsolved but has raised many puzzling theories. Before we begin, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now, without any further ado, let's dive into the case. Home to about 17,000 people, the beautiful city of Hannibal serves as a great spot for a weekend getaway because of various activities it offers to tourists as well as locals. This river city is quite a unique place as it offers events like ghost tours and some history-filled adventures. Also famous for being the birthplace and home of Mark Twain, Missouri's most charming town came into the public eye for all the wrong reasons in 2009. Hannibal isn't one of the safest places in America. Safer than only 4% of the US cities, a person's chance to fall victim to a dangerous crime is 1 out of 275 in Hannibal, Missouri. And sadly, Hannibal became the setting for the disappearance of Christina Whitaker a 21-year-old mother in November 2009. Christina Whitaker was born on March 25, 1988, and brought up in her Hannibal, Missouri home. Christina stayed with her young parents, Cindy Elzia Young and Alex Young, and grew up with her protective brothers, Jeremy and Brian Whitaker. She was loved and pampered by all in her family, especially her mother. We lived in Hannibal there. We've lived there our, all of our lives, both of us, and our kids were born and raised, all of us there. Are you counting your eggs before yeah. they're hatched, Christina? Yeah. She grew up into an adorable, red-haired, five-foot-five girl with light brown eyes. She went to Hannibal High School and then Hannibal Senior High. By 2009, she was 21 and had two tattoos on her body. On her right ankle, she had a Care Bear holding a green marijuana leaf and on the other one, a large angel was on the back of her left shoulder. On April 27, 2009, Christina gave birth to a baby girl, whose father was Christina's then-boyfriend, Dustin Johnston. She was only 21 at that time. They named their daughter Alexandria, but after a couple of months, Christina and Dustin decided to split up. Christina then met Travis Blackwell, and they started dating soon after. Christina and Alexandria moved in with Travis into his apartment. She would stay home and take care of Alexandria while Travis went to work. Christina loved her daughter and wanted the best for her. However, Christina herself had a troubled life. Cindy described Christina as mentally fragile, naive and prone to childlike behaviour. Christina was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, bipolar disorder and anxiety attacks for which she would often take prescription medication. Christina always found comfort in talking to her mother, Cindy, no matter what time of the day it was. There wasn't a day that would go by without Christina talking to Cindy, whether it was over a call or texting. Cindy was Christina's biggest support system. On Thursday, November 12, 2009, Christina called her friends and asked them to meet her the next day for drinks. She was quite excited to see her friends as she hadn't been out in months, ever since she'd had her daughter. As planned, on Friday night, November 13th, 2009, Christina and her friends were going to meet at Rookie Sports Bar on 611 Broadway at 8.30pm. Travis decided to drive Christina and dropped her at the bar. They arrived a little late, around 8.45pm, but it didn't matter because at the end of the day, Christina only wanted to see her friends. She walked in and joined her friends at a table. Jokes and conversations followed, accompanied by drinks as they caught up with each other's lives. 
Christina was having a good time and it was turning out to be a fun evening until Christina became overly intoxicated after having too much to drink. Christina became restless and started to spoil the night for everyone else. Curtis Rain, a bouncer at Rookies, escorted Christina out for causing too much disturbance. She later managed to get in again and asked her friends to drive her home. All her friends declined to do so as none of them wanted to leave the bar yet. Considering Christina's condition, it is surprising that none of her friends seemed even a little bit concerned about her. Christina then left Rookie Sports Bar and went out on a chilly winter night. That was the last time her friends saw her. Christina never returned home. The next morning, when Travis didn't find Christina in his apartment, he called her mother, Cindy, to inform her. Cindy and her husband, Alex, were in Texas at that time. As soon as she heard the news from Travis, Cindy sensed that something wasn't right. Cindy and Alex immediately decided to drive back to Hannibal. On Sunday, November 15th, 2009, Cindy filed a missing persons report to the Hannibal Police Department. Christina's case was assigned to Lieutenant Jennifer Grote of Hannibal Police Department. She and her team were quite surprised that Cindy waited for more than 24 hours before she filed a report with the police. They acquired Christina's phone on Monday, November 16th, 2009 from her boyfriend, Travis, and found out that the phone had gone through many hands after Christina went missing. Around 7am on Saturday, November 14th, 2009, Christina's phone was found by a man named Danny Baker, just a few houses away from Sportsman's Bar. He went through her phone and recognised Christina's aunt. In a couple of hours, he dropped Christina's phone at her aunt's place. Christina's aunt then called Travis and asked him to collect the phone the same day. Travis took Christina's phone around 5.30pm after work. The very next day, on November 15, 2009, Cindy took possession of the phone from Travis. She went through Christina's phone, scrolling through her call logs and text messages, but didn't find anything suspicious. The police then requested for the phone and it was delivered to them by Travis on Monday. Clearly a lot of people went through Christina's phone right after she went missing. This seemed a little odd to the police. When Christina's phone records came back, the police questioned Travis about a call between him and Christina made at 10.30pm on the night she went missing. Travis told them that Christina had called him to let him know that she would be bringing him breakfast from the diner. She also said that she might call him again around 12.30am to pick her up, in case she didn't find a ride home. They searched the whole area around the Rookie Sports Bar. When Christina's friends and the staff at the bar were interrogated, a few blurry but important details were uncovered. Christina's friends stated that Christina was highly intoxicated and acting aggressive. She was seen taking her prescribed Vicodin and Xanax, which can complicate the management of bipolar disorder and cause impaired judgment when mixed with alcohol. Her friends too were quite drunk and didn't want to leave the bar to drop her home. Christina was then removed from the bar around 11.30pm. Christina managed to get back in after some time and asked her friends to drop her home, but still, none of them would budge. Christina then joined two unidentified men who were playing pool at the time. Around 11.45pm, Christina left the bar with these men. I don't know, I remember if there was one or two guys, but one guy came in and grabbed her and then they, they actually left. According to Christina's friends, she was wearing a pink tank top, jeans, a white half sleeve shirt with pink and white Nikes. The police started questioning the staff members of other nearby places to see if any of them had seen Christina that night. They learned that Christina was seen all by herself at River City Billiards on 603 Broadway just next door. Christina was then spotted at another bar called Sportsman's Bar on 1112 South 7th Street. Vanessa Swank, a bartender at Sportsman's, was a close friend of the young family and knew Christina well. She told the police that Christina came into the bar when they were about to close. She was asking strangers to drop her home, but nobody agreed. A few minutes later, Vanessa saw Christina arguing with someone over the phone. Vanessa thought of going to her after closing up the bar, but by that time, she saw Christina sobbing 
and running out of the back door. That was the last time Vanessa saw her. The police worked hard to find a potential suspect, but always found themselves at a dead end. The word about the case soon spread, and it gained a lot of media publicity. Not only the town of Hannibal, but the whole country was curious about Christina Whitaker's disappearance. On November 23, 2009, the Hannibal Police Department contacted the FBI and asked for their assistance. The combined team got to work immediately. They followed every tip that came in, brought in the canine squad, and even had boats patrolling the Mississippi River, which was only half a mile away from the bars Christina had visited on the night she went missing. Two weeks after Christina's disappearance, an informant gave the police a tip about a potential suspect. The person was Darcy Morris. The informant told the police that Darcy was involved in a massive drugs and human trafficking business in Peoria and would often target people in Hannibal. The informant also said that he was the one who abducted Christina and took her to Peoria himself. The police wasted no time in questioning Morris. He denied that he had anything to do with Christina or her disappearance. He even had an alibi to prove that he wasn't at Rookie Sports Bar the night Christina went missing. Morris told the police that he was celebrating his anniversary with his wife that night. When the police dug a little deeper, they found out that Morris actually had a very long rap sheet that included multiple domestic abuse and battery charges. He was also famous by his name Bookie. The police asked Christina's friends if they knew Morris or if they saw him at the bar with Christina that night. They all said they hadn't. The detectives didn't have any evidence to charge Morris with anything, and he was let go. Sometime later, Anthony McPike, Morris's cousin, came forward and claimed that he and Morris were with Christina that November night at Rookie's sports bar playing pool. He said that they were supposed to drop Christina home, but instead, ended up taking her to Peoria. Christina's friends saw Anthony at the bar, but didn't remember whether the other guy with Anthony was Morris. Even after this, Morris denied having any ties with Christina. Years later, Anthony reached out to the police again and claimed that Morris had written him a letter in which he confessed to abducting Christina and killing her. The letter also said that Morris buried her in a hog farm in Ursa, and her body could be found there. When the police asked Anthony to present this letter, he said that in order to protect himself, he had to destroy the letter for his own legal safety. And yet again, the police were left going around in circles with many questions still unanswered. A few sources close to Christina's family claim that Morris and Christina did know each other. It was rumoured that Christina had some sort of relationship with Morris and would often buy drugs for him. Some even claimed that they were dating each other. Cindy was shocked after hearing about Morris's connection with Christina. She hired a private investigator and made her way to Peoria. Cindy tried her best to find her daughter there. She and her PI would often question people and spread awareness about Christina being forced into human trafficking. She had high hopes that she would find her daughter here, but even after spending a significant amount of time in Peoria, Cindy couldn't find any trace of Christina and returned home to Cannibal. Steve Wilkos, an American TV personality, invited Christina's family and friends to his show 82 days after the night of Christina's disappearance. The episode, which was titled Did You Kill Christina, was aired in February 2010. The episode brought many previously undisclosed details about Christina's case into the light. For a long time, Cindy had suspected Travis, Christina's boyfriend at the time she went missing, of being involved in her daughter's disappearance, and she did not shy away from speaking about it on Steve's show. She accused Travis of showing no emotion or concern following Christina's disappearance. I need the answers. I want to know, did Travis have anything to do with it? Cindy even stated that the 10.30pm call between Christina and him most likely involved a heated argument. One of Christina's friends even confirmed that Christina and Travis did have a fight over a call that night. She said that both of them had a history of extreme domestic abuse between them. 
In the show's final segment, Wilco's made Travis take two lie detector tests regarding Christina's disappearance. According to Wilco's, he did not tell the truth and failed both the tests. And the results for Travis's lie detector tests is that he did not tell the truth. Since then, Travis, as well as Dustin, the father of her child, were put under a magnifying glass, and the police made sure they didn't miss out any clues. It seemed like it was turning into a clear-cut case from then onwards, which gave people hope to find answers. Only a few days after the show aired, everything went to waste when Cindy publicly took back all her accusations against Travis. She thought that Travis was a good person and wouldn't do anything to hurt her daughter. She even claimed that Travis took a lie detector test carried out by the Hannibal Police Department and passed it. Cindy's sudden change of opinions left people confused. Later, the police too cleared both Dustin Johnston and Travis Blackwell as potential suspects. Over the next few years, the case started to go cold. So in 2014, Christina's family announced a reward of $10,000 for anyone who could provide any information about Christina's whereabouts. Years went by, and nobody stepped forward with any information. Christina's family waited and waited, but they could never find any solid information, and this reward too went unclaimed. Breezy was a friend of Christina who was supposed to drop her home the night she went missing. Cindy was very disappointed in Breezy, as she thought that if she had been a little concerned about Christina that night, she would still be here, safe and sound. During the initial days after Christina's disappearance, Cindy and Breezy fell out of touch and lost contact with each other. It wasn't until early January 2020 when Breezy contacted Cindy out of the blue. Breezy had a confession to make. She told Cindy that on the night of Christina's disappearance, she did see Darcy Morris at Rookie Sports Bar. A black-coloured car pulled up at the back of Rookie's. Christina went there and got some drugs from Darcy, who was sitting in the passenger seat. Cindy remembered that Breezy had earlier denied to the police that she ever saw Darcy at Rookie's. This piece of information was massively important, because this scenario linked the suspect to the victim. Breezy reportedly told the police everything, but she didn't tell them about Darcy. When questioned by Cindy, Breezy said she didn't tell anyone about it because she didn't want to get Christina to get into trouble. Cindy sent her personal investigator to Breezy so he could get a statement from her, but Breezy, once again, denied seeing or knowing Morris. Apart from the findings of the police's investigations, there were multiple theories that had been lingering around Hannibal. One of them even targets the authorities and suspects that they were involved in Christina's disappearance. The word about this theory spread like wildfire when Christina's family and the people of Hannibal noticed that the police were trying to keep things under wraps in Christina's case. New developments in her case were not being reported to Christina's family. Even the full report of Christina's phone records was not shared with her family. This kind of suspicious behaviour by the Hannibal Police Department made a lot of people point fingers at them. Some people came forward and claimed that about three police officers from the Hannibal Department had been accused of having sexual relationships with Christina. It was also rumoured that the officers that were known to trade favours with young girls as a way for them to avoid legal trouble and get a clean chit. A year and a half before Christina went missing, she had gotten a ticket for driving on a revoked licence. In order to get that ticket thrown out, she agreed to work for an officer. It wasn't confirmed whether she was approached by a police officer or she volunteered herself to work as a confidential informant for the police department to clear off her ticket. The officers would make her buy and sell drugs which would get her in contact with other dealers in and around the town. She would then provide these dealers' contacts and whereabouts to the police so they could bust them. In this case, Christina was in great danger, as it meant that if anyone from the drug trafficking industry recognised her, she would be in trouble. 
and a lot of people from Hannibal thought that this was what happened, and that the police were trying to cover up their own mess, which resulted in Christina's disappearance. Another set of people believed in a completely different scenario. These people were sure that Christina disappeared on her own will, and nobody else is to be blamed for it. They said that Christina was probably fed up with her life and had toxic relationships with her family members and friends. So she decided to run away and start afresh. Since Christina's phone was not immediately handed over to the police after being found, some people suspected that Christina's family too could be a reason behind her disappearance. The phone went through many hands before finally reaching the police and any of those people who accessed Christina's phone would have had enough time to get rid of any evidence or clues on her phone. When Cindy heard of this news going around town, she felt hurt. She simply countered this assumption by letting everyone know that Christina was loved by all her family members and friends. And apart from that, she had a six-month-old daughter waiting for her at home. Christina loved Alexandria and would never even think of abandoning her. Some people were sure that Christina's disappearance was an accident. They believed that the authorities overlooked some significant geographic details which suggest that Christina could have drowned. The road on which Rookie's Sports Bar and Sportsman's Bar are located stretches up to the Mississippi River and ends right next to it. The river is only half a mile away from the bars Christina visited that night. It would have taken only nine minutes for Christina to walk to the river. Thinking of Christina's drunk and disoriented mental condition that night, people assumed that she walked to the river, and as it was dark, she slipped and fell into the stream. The powerful currents in the river would have made it nearly impossible for her to swim to safety, especially when she was intoxicated. It is believed that the river washed her hundreds of miles downstream, eventually drowning her. However, the police didn't completely overlook this assumption and had boats search for Christina throughout the river with no luck. Some people also noted the rural nature of Hannibal's setting. If Christina had decided to walk home that night and taken the route through the woods, hypothermia might have set in. It was a cold night on November 13, 2009, when Christina disappeared and temperatures were said to have dropped to as low as 39.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Christina was not dressed well to have survived such low temperatures. There wasn't any solid proof to back up any of these theories. While some of these theories were quite plausible, there were dozens of others which were headed in completely different directions. Cindy was fighting every day to get her daughter back, and these theories were not any help to her. She believed that Morris trafficked Christina to Peoria, and she was now trapped there. Cindy was determined to get her back safe. In 2021, director Christina Fontana released a documentary called Relentless. She worked on Christina Whitaker's case for 11 years and gathered a significant amount of information, which included more than 400 hours of footage. In the last episode of the six-part docuseries, an incarcerated source who chose not to reveal their identity gave a tip claiming that Christina Whitaker's body could be found buried in a well on a property. Damn. Oh, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like in the wooded area. There's a wooded area. Yes, okay. Oh my God, okay. This is the closest I have felt. The property in question was formerly owned by a man named Glenn Ledbetter. However, without any proof or evidence, the authorities couldn't get a search warrant for the property and the new owner of the land denied access to them. There is no evidence that links Glenn Ledbetter or the new owner of the property to the crime yet. Darcy Morris was arrested for beating a man to death on July 11, 2013 in Peoria. On September 30, 2014, Morris pled guilty to his crimes and was charged with one count of murder. As part of a plea agreement, he received a 25-year sentence. Lieutenant Jennifer Grote had worked on Christina's case since day one. 
She interviewed more than 200 people in connection with the investigation in Christina's case. The people Grote interviewed also included people who were incarcerated for other crimes. Lieutenant Grote had worked with 45 agencies to gather even the tiniest bit of evidence that would lead her to Christina. In June 2021, Christina's family increased the reward offered by them to $25,000. Cindy believed that she would someday find her daughter and bring her home. She never lost hope. Sadly, Christina Whitaker has still not been found, and there have been no arrests in connection with her case. However, there have been multiple reports of her being spotted in Peoria. A waitress working in a cafe near East Peoria claimed that she saw Christina just days after her initial disappearance. But that's not all. A woman even claimed that she had spent time with Christina in a mental hospital. However, according to the Peoria Police Department, there have been no confirmed sightings of Christina in the area. A narcotics officer also claimed to have seen Christina when he was questioning the woman, but this woman ran away from the officer and he couldn't confirm her identity. There were many such cases where a bartender or waiter claimed to have seen Christina, but none of them led the police anywhere. One sighting which sparked a wave took place in Guadalajara. A red-haired woman, who looked a lot like Christina, was spotted in a terrible condition crying on the streets of Guadalajara. The woman's hands and feet were swollen and she looked mentally disoriented. Many people were sure that this was Christina Whitaker. The authorities got in touch with Cindy Young and her family immediately, and Cindy confirmed that this woman was not her daughter. After all this time, Cindy Young never lost hope. She fought for her daughter every day and hoped for her return. On March 25, 2023, Christina's family celebrated her 34th birthday together. They lit green and pink lanterns, Christina's favorite colors, to honor Christina and prayed for her safety. Cindy has kept publishing posts on her social media accounts as a way of communicating with Christina. She kept her updated about Alexandria, her life, and how she grew up to be a wonderful teenager. Cindy only hopes that Christina is somewhere out there reading these posts about how her family misses her and wishes for her return. Hi, Christina. I don't know if you'll ever see this video, sweetheart. Um, usually I write to you on here, but... I don't know if you ever see my letters or not. I hate it that Facebook is the only way I think I have a way of reaching you. Even after more than 13 years from her disappearance, Christina Whittaker's case remains an unsolved mystery. The world still wonders whether her disappearance was an abduction, a suicide, or a murder. After vanishing with only a few traces, Christina Whittaker left behind Alexandria her mother, Cindy Young, and hundreds of unanswered questions. Christina was a loving mother who was just excited to go out with her friends after a long time. But what happened to her that night left her loved ones horrified. Alexandria has had to grow up without the love and care of her mother. Cindy misses her, but still stands strong and believes that Christina is somewhere out there. Even though every day is a challenge for her, she still continues to fight for her daughter with the hopes of her coming back home someday. Did Christina really fall victim to a predator who trafficked her to Prioria? Or did she simply run away to start her life afresh? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Do not forget to like, comment and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe and thanks for watching.